Okay, we're almost at the finish line. For anyone debating whether to stick around or not, uh, Ina is not just the new CEO of Axios. She's going to be Oprah in a few minutes' time. There's going to be a giveaway, so make sure you stick around for us, that. And you'll be able to meet with all of the Axios AI team, the reporters and the editors at the networking reception. Now, our next conversation is going to be with a man who has seen it all in Silicon Valley. His latest adventure is transforming enterprise AI. And on that note, uh, we're going to invite to the stage Tom Siebel, the CEO and founder of C3 AI. Welcome, Tom. Now, it's dangerous to stand between people and their drinks, so let's dive right into it. Um, we saw a bunch of smart people call for a pause in AI development. They wanted some guardrails. Then last week, we saw leaders and CEOs say they would do um, pre-deployment testing. Elon Musk signed up to both of those things. And then it turns out, behind all of the curtains, he was just developing Grok. What do you make of that? Well, first of all, I'll just close. I'm a huge Elon fan. But it was a little curious when on, what, I think, March 27th, 2023, he announced that you know the you know the diabolical implications of generative AI are sufficiently um, terrifying that we need to pause development, pause our development on AI for six months. So while he caused everyone, while he uh, wanted everybody else to pause development uh, on generative AI for six months, he was fur furiously working away developing Grok that he released to market about eight months later. And uh, so, well played, Elon. And is that, is that just the chess game here, that the people that were getting into the market first are now just looking for ways to close the gate behind them with licensing and other systems? Or if there's anybody in the game who can play the game within the game within the game, it's Elon. Okay. And so. And can anyone go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him? Is Sam Altman going to get crushed? Can Mark Zuckerberg do it? Oh, I think it's just a open game. You know, when you get into generative AI, the amount of innovation that's going on there uh, with these transformers is just truly amazing. And you know, the amount of development and innovation that's taking place is breathtaking. Uh, I think it's kind of generally assumed that one of OpenAI or Microsoft or Facebook or Google is going to win this battle. I don't think there's any reason to believe that at all. I mean, usually when we've had these big transitions to Ethernet and the Internet or personal computing, uh, the, you know, the, the smartphone, uh, Elastic Cloud computing, you name it, the, uh, you know, the winner was somebody that nobody ever expected. Yeah. And I mean, how did IBM miss the cloud? Uh, how did, um, um, you know, where did, I mean, goodness, where did Amazon come from? They were in the book business last time I checked. Okay, and when... Okay. I think he had a plan. I okay, don't think he and just stumbled okay, and upon when, And ridiculous. when I remember Eric Schmidt was on the board of Siebel Systems when he came to me um, in, I forget what year this was, maybe about 2002, 2003, he said, Tom, I'm, I think I'm going to go become the CEO of Google. What do you think of that idea? I said, you know, I think this is the craziest idea I've ever heard of. You had, you had Yahoo had 90% market share in, in search, remember that? And, you know, and, you know, what was Google? Well, so, you know, the people who win tend to be these unknowns, and I suspect it'll be an unknown. But between now and the, and the, and the, the, the declaration of a winner, there's going to be massive innovation. And do you mean that battle, that sort of win-loss situation, is narrowly on foundation models, or you mean more broadly across generative AI? I think it's more broadly across generative AI, including uh, foundation models, large language models, you know, kind of writ large, yeah. multimodal, and everything that people can imagine that these might be, it will happen, both uh, uh, beneficially and detrimentally. And is that competition going to eat up the money that can be made in foundation models and just let people like you It'll enterprise AI up as in. much money as Mark Andreessen and Sequoia can print, okay? And so <laughs> that's a, okay, and that's a lot, okay? So, you know, it's going to consume a lot of cash, but there will be, you know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of innovation. The world will be a different place. In many ways, it'll be a better place, and in many ways, it'll be a scary place. Mm -hmm. Now, on something like pre-deployment testing, uh, I was personally really surprised that leaders agreed to that and that CEOs just signed up to it. Like, I was not expecting that to come out of this UK summit. Um, is that a promise that 
can actually be delivered, or is that a promise that's going nowhere? Like, is it too good to be true? I mean, this is, come on, this is, this is uh, Sam and Sundar. I mean, they're playing rope-a-dope with the Congress. They're playing rope-a-dope with the, with, with the leaders in the UK. I mean, the, the idea that we're going to have a regulatory agency that is going to introspect algorithms for safety prior to their being released, I mean, this is just, it's crazy. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. There isn't enough money, there aren't enough people, there isn't enough intellect, and the numbers are just too large. I mean, we have machine-developed algorithms today. At what rate are we developing algorithms? Order of millions? No. And somebody is actually gonna inspect these things and determine that they're safe? I mean, God, these people who are developing large language models, some of which are maybe in this room, I mean, we don't even know how they work. The people yeah. who are developing who don't know how they work, how is, a, is some regulator gonna introspect them to determine whether they're safe. This is just crazy talk. Yeah. So, but they stand up before Congress and say, please regulate us. They get a headline in the New York Times and uh, they get off they're with a good They're just talking out of both sides of their mouth in your view. They don't, they, they don't, make they don't believe it's possible for a minute. The yeah. numbers are too large. So given how transformative AI is, and you clearly believe that too because you're in the business, um, what can government usefully do? I think like government can't just sit back and do nothing. So what, what I, I think government do? can legislate. I mean, I mean, you can legislate. There's a legitimate okay. function of government. I mean, let, let's look at something that everybody is in favor of, the right to be forgotten. Okay, why don't we simply, and, and these privacy issues are yep. truly terrifying, yep. both today and tomorrow. Uh, you know, um, we don't have to wait for sentient AI for it to be terrifying. It's terrifying now. And why not simply pass a law that said it is unlawful to publish an algorithm that collects personally identifiable information unless upon request, the information gets deleted. And if you don't delete it, you go to prison, hard stop, okay? And it, you know, you might have to put you know, Mark Zuckerberg in jail, okay, you know, okay. fine. Okay, and then people won't do it anymore. The problem will be solved. How about make it unlawful to publish an algorithm that can be used to uh, propagate a public health hazard. Again, see Facebook for details, see what this is doing. Yeah. You know, um, so, sorry. But, the, uh, but then who's gonna enforce that? You, you, you weren't very We have a very rich law enforcement system in the Western world, okay. in Europe, and in the United States. Okay, so prosecutors use, then, rather than Use the criminal justice the system, it's government. there. We have a jurisprudence system, yeah. let's use it. It's well established. Yeah. It's been there for, you know, for centuries, in some cases, millennia. Yeah. Well, while we're on the topic of meta and social media and Mark, um, weigh in on how we should weigh up the relative risks of uh, what is going on in other parts of the tech world versus the idea that we have catastrophic risks in AI or existential risks later on down the line. What, what should we actually be worried about? Given well, everything everybody's seen. worried about sentient AI. The idea that you know your smart refrigerator is going to take over your house, okay? <laughs> And you know, you, so you listen to the CEO of DeepMind, and he'll stand up on a stage like this and say that he believes that there is a, a you know, 50% probability that we'll have sentient computers by 2030. Okay, you know, maybe we will, maybe we won't. And, and, and honestly, when we deal with this idea that in AI, people actually arrogantly believe that we're building algorithms that somehow emulate what goes on in the human brain. In the human brain. I mean, that is just the height of, hair, of hubris, of arrogance. There's no way. And for, I mean, for us to run these AI models, we have to run you know, billions of inferences, and we're using gigawatts of energy. Guys, yeah. the human brain with 12 watts and it runs on 12 watts, okay? And with a few inferences, can come up with a pretty good worldview pretty fast. Yeah. And so it's not a, so I don't think it's even close. Yeah. So, so maybe by 2030, we'll have a sentient computer, I don't know, and we have to worry about the smart refrigerator, okay, taking over your house, okay? But how about deal with deal with people with what's going on now, okay? People, it's, it is November of 2023. There are 40 million people enslaved on the planet Earth today. Okay, the Uyghurs in China, okay, sex slaves, the Middle East, Asia, you name it, this is real, okay? We've got human problems this that is, you think well, we what, need what to is the, so. What is the primary exchange for the slave trade in the world? It is AI, social media, hard stop. Okay, we know that using social media, young women ages, okay, 11 to 14, okay, are propositioned multiple times a week. 
Okay, this is a fact. You read about it in, 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 in the newspaper this week. So, so you, you don't know, buy that you idea. know like, through social media, we know for a fact that we have a public health hazard, particularly with young women, yep. with you know, uh, body image issues, suicide, depression. This is serious. Let's deal with what the problems we have now. How, you know, uh, you know, how about we have you know, weapon systems that we're developing for, uh, for the, the new kill chain you know, without a human in the loop? Mm -hmm. This is as scary as it gets, Ryan. Yeah. And um, you know, I don't think we need to worry about what might happen with a 50% probability of what might happen in 2030. How about to worry about well, with a 100% probability of what's been going on for the last five years? So I take it you don't buy then. Like, to, to, to put the meta hat on for a second, they would turn up here and they would say, well, we're, we're a net benefit to society. Like, yes, there are harms out there, but like, oh, we do more good than we do harm. You don't buy that argument. They should be wearing handcuffs. They should be wearing handcuffs. I mean, there's no, I mean, how do you look yourself in the mirror in the morning? Okay, how do you not slit your throat knowing what you're doing every day? Okay. I mean, I mean give me a minute, I'll tell you what I really think. <laughs> I think we'll save that for the networking reception. Um, let's focus a bit on enterprise AI for a second. Um, what is it about enterprise AI that doesn't turn investors on? You know, why do people go gaga, gaga over something like NVIDIA? How did OpenAI dominate the conversation this year? But, but you and other enterprise AI are out there really being in a lot of spaces, and, and people aren't going gaga over you. What, what is it about? Well, I've been in enterprise application software now for uh, a little over four decades. And we, we're involved in the development of ERP systems and CRM systems and manufacturing systems, supply chain systems. We started that, you know, Oracle and SAP and PeopleSoft and Siebel and other places beginning about 1983. Okay, now that's a half a trillion dollar market today. And it would be impossible to run any enterprise without any of these systems that will allow us to report, what they do is allow us to report with tw perfect 2020 hindsight, what la happened six months ago, how much cash we had, how much stuff broke, what our reliability was, okay, what our fraud rates were, what our ESG footprint was, et cetera. Okay, now, when we, when we bring predictive analytics on top of uh, this, this, fact, this, this set of enterprise applications, they all become predictive in nature. So we can change the future. We can identify what customers are going to leave and prevent them from leaving. Yep. We, can, we can fix supply chain problems that occur at places so like Boeing. So people should want to be all in on C3 So we can AI have the right and, stuff yeah, in yeah. the right place at the right time to deliver a 737 on time. So we can fundamentally improve business processes. And so you know, this is a, you know, probably a trillion dollar software market and the largest market we will have seen you know, in the history of enterprise software. Yeah. But is it that people somehow see your work as commoditized and so therefore they've got a different value? Yeah, last on time it? I checked these AI values, the AI equities were pretty well valued, both in the private market and the public market. So I don't think anything, anybody's got anything to complain okay. about there. Um, now, San Francisco, um, world's AI boomtown, but it's still, there's millions of square feet of empty office space around us while we're sitting here. What does that tell us about SF? What does that tell us about the return to office? What does that tell us about AI and employment? Well, I understand. Uh, let's see, I, I think, I don't know whether it's open AI or anthropic that just uh, rented about a half a million square feet, not very far from here, and they have 100% work from office policy five days a week. Yep. Okay, at C3 AI, okay, we, we put a voluntary work from office policy in place in June of 2022. You can either voluntarily be at your desk or voluntarily go to work company. someplace else. And so, uh, so, uh, so, so we're, we're, how's that working out? How many people volunteer? Well, we have, I have the only full parking lot in Silicon Valley. Okay, and, and, and again, it's full in Silicon Valley, in Tyson's, in Paris, in London, in Rome, in Singapore, and every place we operate, our parking lot is full. And so we have a bunch of very bright, high energy people working elbow to elbow trying to solve really difficult problems, and it's super fun and super high energy. So I don't think this game is really over yet. Yep. You know, I think it's determined yet what the optimal worker environment is. It is interesting that these new Gen AI companies are, have work from office policies. This is how they operate. Yep. So that's a blast out of the past. You know, San Francisco has, you know, I think 
some more fundamental problems that it needs to deal with and some real soul searching. And, you know, I used to live here. Uh, San Francisco was one of the world's great cities. And uh, let's hope it becomes one of the world's great cities again. Mm -hmm. Speaking of some of the, yes, round of applause if, if, if you support San Francisco. Um, now, Americans are generally pretty pessimistic about AI compared to previous generations of technology and progress. Um, half of the people that we surveyed with Morning Consult told us they're worried about losing their job to AI or that someone, one of their loved ones um, might lose their job. Is that, is that a viewpoint that you have sympathy for or what would you say to those people who are worried? You know, I think that any time we look at new technologies, be it the steam engine, be it the production line, be it the transistor, uh, uh, the, the, be it the automobile, these, uh, these, these were disruptive. When we came up with the automobiles, there's no use for Teamsters. Yeah. When you know, we came out with the Jacquard Loom, you know, that didn't work very well for the Luddites in, in the UK, right? We all these textile workers were out of jobs. But I think in every one of these technology transitions, be it the Industrial Revolution, the post-industrial society, which kind of unfolded in the last uh, 40 years, or what's going on with AI, will jobs be eliminated? Yes, but for every job that we eliminate, we'll create 100. So it'll be, sure. you know, I don't think we need to worry so if much. If your job's eliminated, you're a billionaire, so you'll be fine. Like, how, <laughs> how does that work for, for others? Like, what, what's the way to get them to the next stage? Well, I think it's in, basically as leaders, okay, as political leaders or business leaders or community leaders, like everybody here, okay, it's incumbent upon us to either, you know, replace our workforce or train our workforce. Well, you, the right thing to do is train your workforce, okay? Train your people, you know, train your community, train your organization, and have them ready for the new economy so that they can be, become, you know, empowered, okay, and more productive through the use of AI rather than displaced by AI. Tom Siebel, thank you very much. We look forward to hearing what you really think downstairs at the networking reception. <laughs> Ina's up next with a really cool segment. Thank you, sir.